Robert E. Lee is widely considered the greatest general in American history. And he's considered that more than just because of his tactical brilliance or his leadership acumen, but because of his ability to think beyond the battle. His real deep knowledge and understanding that what happened on the battlefield wasn't the end story. And what mattered more was the larger narrative, what happened afterwards, and how it affected the way people thought and felt about what just occurred. That's why after Fredericksburg, when he won a stunning victory, he was enraged. After Chancellorsville, outnumbered two to one, he split his force in front of a larger enemy and delivered a stunning victory, sending the Union retreating up north, saved the Confederate capital. But afterwards, he was furious, absolutely livid. You can imagine this dignified Southern gentleman, the epitome of virtue at the time, red-faced, screaming at his division commanders, you let them get away. Because even though he won the battle, he understood that what happened afterwards, the larger impact, was what really mattered. If a nation's ability to wage war is the product of its means versus its will, Robert E. Lee knew that the North had way greater means than they always would. His only opportunity to win the war was to make the Union's will, the North's will, go to zero. Not just chipping it down battle after battle, but crushing it. He knew he needed to eliminate the Army of the Potomac, destroy it, and the North would not have the will to raise another. That's why he went north to Gettysburg. That's what the whole campaign was about, to destroy the army. And at Gettysburg, the most important moment, Lee's absolute climax of his career, he made crucial mistakes and failed. He failed to really understand the mechanics of the time, to appreciate rifling and the advantage of defensive positions. He failed to really understand the environment and the terrain. He didn't seize Culp's Hill or Little Round Top. And he also, and more importantly, failed to understand the narrative and the characters involved. He was completely blind. He didn't have any cavalry. Why? Because Jeb Stuart set those two commanders to the rear with the gear to embarrass them. Why? Because Jeb Stuart had beef with them. He had a rivalry with one and got in a spat about a girl with the other. And so Lee was caught with his pants down, not because he couldn't muster cavalry, but because he failed to understand the interpersonal relations. He failed to get Longstreet, a trusted subordinate, to really buy into his plan and do what he said. Longstreet dawdled and they made a tactical blunder that cost them dearly and it could have been avoided had he been more successful in persuading his ally. And most importantly, he failed because of personal flaws. He believed his own mythos. He really thought that his boys were invincible and could do anything that he asked of them. And he ordered them on Pickett's charge and that failed drastically and bloodily. And with it, uh, the hopes of the Confederacy were dashed and Lee precipitated the end of his society, romanticized and wistful and yet repulsively evil. I could do a whole nother talk about Robert E. Lee, but I think I might save that for a video on villains. I give daily DM tips on Twitter, and one of them really got picked up last week. There was a pretty big positive response. It even got retweeted by Mike Merles, which I thought was pretty cool. I was trying to give Dungeon Masters advice on how to make more interesting and dynamic combats by thinking it by thinking of combat encounters in terms of three axes, mechanical, environmental, and then most importantly, dramatically, was the dramatic axis. What story impact you want this fight to have? And the further away from zero, the further away from the origin you are in these axes, the more dire, the more deadly the combat, the more dangerous the environment, and the more dramatic the outcome for the battle. Now this is not a balanced video. In fact, I'm notorious for not balancing my encounters. I mean, why would the world care what level the PCs are? And this is not a video to make you better tactically, not to make you a more tactically minded DM. For that, you really need to check out uh, Jim Murphy's amazing video, Combat Encounters. It has one of the, the best pieces of advice I've heard in months. If you wipe out a party with a beholder, big deal, you had a beholder. If you beat a party with a pile of cobalts, well, you're an epic GM. Bravo, brilliant. Hats off to you, good sir. Fantastic sentiment. Not one that I personally enjoy. I like dragons and beholders, but a really great, unique perspective. I really encourage everyone to check that out. Most important one, and the one that I think DMs tend to skip over, not really think about a whole lot, the dramatic access, the narrative access. What made the critical role finale so epic, so memorable? It wasn't the, the AC or the attack bonus of the bad guy. That wasn't the real challenge. The real challenge was in the story. It was in the narration. 
the climax wasn't the fight with the bad guy. The climax was the character arc that ran through the fight. That's what's going to make it so memorable. 50 years from now, people will still be talking about it. But not all sessions need to be that dramatic. That's why we have an axis. So our dramatic axis goes from zero, where things are boring, you don't really care about them, to an event that's going to affect the session, the adventure, and at the very top of the campaign. Notice how this goes with localized story arcs. Now, whether or not it's affecting the region, the kingdom, or the multiverse, because you should be able to achieve maximum drama, the highest part in this arc, at any tier of play, at any campaign level. Now, combat in D&D, especially boss fights, have a lot of intrinsic trauma. There's dice rolls and uncertainty, and you need to know whether or not your character is going to die or whether or not you're going to survive. And that adds some inherent tension. But what I really want to challenge you to do is try to think about things not just tactically, but dramatically. Think beyond the fight. That's my reply to Jim Murphy. Oh, you kill your party with cobalts? Big deal. I kill my party with drama. I'm an epic DM. <laughs> I crush their souls. So what I'm going to do is give you some tools to use to add some dramatic tension to your fights. I think the first thing you want to do is think of two things. One, what can I give my players besides killing baddies that will make them feel successful? Maybe they can find some treasure or rescue their brother or restore their family's honor. And you also want to think of some things that you can take away from your characters. What besides dying will make my characters feel lost? I've brought shame upon my family. I've lost my beloved. My brother is now going down an evil path. Think of challenges that you can present to your players that they can't solve mechanically. There's no spell to restore honor. There's no sword that can make your brother see the air of his ways. And no armor class can make a henchman have a change of heart. Once you have an idea of what these elements are, these little plot points, you can drop them in your combats. And more than that, you can have them be obtainable, but have the villain interpose and then have the result of the fight with the villain have an effect on the resolution of that plot point. For example, let's say that the Cobalt is running away over a pit of lava on a tightrope. He has the key to the treasure room, so if you just kill him outright, he'll fall in and you'll lose the treasure for the dungeon. Or maybe your brother is working with an evil henchman holding someone's beloved over a cliff with a dagger to his throat. Maybe if you can get in a fight with his boss, he can see the air of his ways and let the lover go. If you kill him outright, they'll both fall to their doom. Or maybe you need some help from the wise women of the tribe, but there's gnolls attacking. Whether or not you can defeat the gnolls while protecting the village from destruction, it's going to have a big impact on whether or not you get advice from the wise women to continue your quest. There are all sorts of ways to add friction and tension in the guise of a fight. Remember, not all the climax needs to come from people duking it out. A lot of it needs to come from the story elements, your internal character arcs. Another tool I use is I never have villains monologue. Once you've been DMing for a while, I'm sure that you've had the story where you, the players reach the end of the dungeon, you have your big bad there, and he starts to give his dramatic speech about revealing all the details of his, your, master plan. And all of a sudden, one of your players gets tired of the yak, yak, yakking, and he shoots a crossbow and pff, tries to shut him up. Well, A, that player's kind of being a tool, and B, that just sort of took the air out of the whole situation. So my solution to this is not to have the villain monologue. My solution is to have him talk during the combat. When the players are fighting, you're expected to narrate as the DM anyway. That's your opportunity to give about his bits of his speech, reveal some of his plan, and also to add some emotional traps. Remember, roleplay doesn't end when initiative is rolled. Adding these emotional traps is a way for you to add more dramatic elements. It could put a timer on the battle. If you don't defeat the villain within five rounds, a village 200 miles away is going to explode. Maybe the villain has somebody held hostage that you need. You didn't realize it until right now, and their life forces are tied together. Because there's so much uncertainty in the mechanics of D&D, you're never going to be able to have complete control over that. You never know if your bat is going to roll all ones, or your players are going to roll all 20s, or what's going to happen with a hold person or a force cage completely obliterating what you thought was going to be a cool set piece encounter. But what you can do is control the feel of the combat. And that will still lead to satisfying results, even if you don't get the mechanics in the fight that you want. Engaging with this narrative access is also the solution to one of the most 
common questions I see. How do I challenge high-level characters? The answer is you don't challenge them with hit points and armor class and saving throws. You challenge them with the story. The real challenge needs to be in the narration. In my last video, I talked about how I TPK'd an 18th level party. And you can ask any of the players, and they'll tell you it wasn't because of the spell list or attack bonus. It was because of the character conflict, the flaws and cross-purposes that the characters were working at in that final battle. The cleric gave her heart over to an evil god. The mercenary chose greed over friendship. The outcast gnome couldn't trust a more skilled party member. And the prophesied one stopped believing in her own destiny. It was these issues, their internal flaws, that led them not to be able to work together as a team and led to their demise. That's the situation that was set up. That was the dramatic challenge. And they fell short. If you ask them, it's not a situation of, I killed them. It's a situation of, they just didn't win. And that's what we're after. That dramatic resonance is going to last long after the game is over. Our second axis is our environmental axis. This measures how the terrain and the location are going to affect the outcome of this encounter. It goes from benign or non-existent like an open field to passive features up to active features. Passive features are things like cover, concealment, and things that restrict mobility. Cover is things like a, a tree or a boulder, something that makes you harder to hit, but everyone still knows where you are and they still, can still get to you. Concealment are things that hide you from view, hide you from spell targeting, and adds a layer of uncertainty to the battlefield. And restrictions on mobility are more or less permanent terrain features, uh, difficult terrain, elevation, things that both sides can take advantage of. A big mud pit in the middle restricts your mobility, but a mountainous crag with lots of boulders offers you cover, concealment, and restriction mobility. So you can mix and match these features to get a whole lot of variation into your encounters. Going up past these passive features, we have active features. And these are things that Matt Click would call the environment as a combatant. Things like an earthquake, or an avalanche, or a cave-in, or maybe jets of fire shooting across. Things that are not only going to have an immediate impact on your combat encounter, but might be considered the centerpiece of the encounter as a whole. Another dial you can sort of play with in this environmental axis is whether or not the terrain starts out as neutral or favoring the enemy. Now note, I never go so it favors the players. If they want that advantage, they're going to have to find it and seek it on their own. For example, we can have a fire elemental in a dungeon room. We can have a fire elemental in a volcano, which is going to favor the enemy. But we're never going to have a fire elemental underwater, unless the players somehow find a way to trick him into getting there. But what I'm going to talk about is this axis of mechanical complexity and how to make your combats more interesting. So one thing I want to talk about right off the bat is the further away you get, remember, the more dire the circumstance. So in this particular case, the more mechanically complex something it's getting, the more deadly it's becoming at the same time. This is one key to avoid a slog, where you're just chipping away at an opponent's hit points and armor class, and it just kind of gets boring after a while. So the first thing we're going to do to add some mechanical complexity are unique qualifiers. Unique qualifiers are things that your party does not normally have to do in a combat encounter, such as flip a lever, or do a bunch of damage to reveal the boss's true form, solving a puzzle, or needing to move objects around the room, or maybe complete a more complex ritual over a couple of turns and that spends several actions. These are things that you can add in to make your combats individually unique, something that they're not going to see again for many, many sessions afterwards. The second thing you can do to add some mechanical complexity is using mixed monster types. Now, Nerdarchy has a whole video series called Monster Mashup. Fantastic, check it out. But the gist of it is that all these monsters have unique abilities in their features. Now, all monsters have a couple of variables that you can mix and match to get unique outcomes. Some monsters have high armor class but low HP. Some are easy to hit but have lots and lots of health. And they all have special features to them that make them unique. And so you can find some unique pairings. Maybe they're a monster that is immune to acid mixed with one that spits acid out. And again, whenever we're making combat more complex by adding these elements in, we also need to make sure they're making it more deadly because we need the players to really buy in. If they're going to invest the time to learn a new system or a new mechanic or to really pay attention to what's going on, there needs to be something at stake. You need to make it feel like learning this information is not just a waste of time, but it's going to save their lives. All right, bad encounter. You kick down the door. It's an empty room with a bunch of orcs in it. So let's explore how we can employ these axes two at a time to make a more interesting encounter. So you kick down the door, and instead of just an empty room, there's some magical darkness in one area offering concealment, and a couple of pillars jutting up that the orcs are hiding behind, giving them cover when they launch their longbow attacks. 
Let's say that there's an owlbear chained up in the corner, and one of the orcs is going to run over, take it off its collar, and the owlbear is going to run free. So now I have a mixed monster type and a dynamic element to make this mechanically more complex. Or we can engage the terrain and narrative access. We still have our pillars and our magical darkness, but now there's a story element. Inside the magical darkness, you hear a faint cry for help. Is it a prisoner? Is it an orc trying to trick us? The darkness makes it unknown. It adds a dramatic effect to it. Or we can do the dramatic pillar and the mechanical pillar. So we still have our orcs with the owlbear chained up, but now it's just an empty room again. And so you can see a prisoner chained up on the far side. He's crying out for help, and he has a call around his neck that's going to take an action to unlock. But if the orcs run over and get the owlbear, the owlbear will eat the prisoner. Nom, 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 nom. So those are pretty all low stakes things. They're not going to affect anything more than just the session, and they're not super complex, and the train is just a few minor elements. So let's try to crank that all the way up, all the accesses to the extreme. So instead of just a bunch of orcs, one of them's gonna be a orc chieftain, one of them's gonna be an orc shaman. And instead of just having an owlbear, let's also have a gigantic ballista. They'll take two people to operate, but will deal massive amounts of damage if they get it off. Instead of just magical darkness and some pillars, let's also put this in a collapsing cavern. So now there's rocks falling and an earthquake that's gonna shift the terrain. And instead of just having one prisoner, let's have a few of them calling out from that darkness. One of them saying that he is just a prisoner, and the other voice is calling out, hey, that sounds like my lost friend. He, maybe he knows the true story. Maybe he knows that my family was not the traitor and can redeem my honor. So we have a whole lot going on. You have to save the boy to save your honor. You have to kill the orc chieftain. You have to deal with the ballista and the owlbear threat. There's all these elements that are going to make this combat really meaningful and interesting for your players to take part in. Yeah, so that's the video, folks. It was a pretty long one, but just remember the three axes. Uh, mechanical complexity, how active and dangerous your terrain is, and how dramatic you want the outcome of this fight to be. You can follow me on Twitter for daily DM tips at Zipper on Disney. Make sure you hit the like or subscribe button so I know what kind of content I should make more of. And as always, let me know what you think in the comments below. Lee's biggest challenges were emotional, based on relationships, and about human motivation. These are story elements that he failed to really understand and overcome.